Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's question and answer session on identifying and assessing your child's support needs. Before we get started, it might be helpful if I just explain a little bit about who we are in case you haven't come across us before. So Inquire provides independent advice and information to parents, carers, professionals, and children and young people about support for learning in Scottish schools. We cover things like your rights as a parent or carer, your child's rights to support for learning, uh, your local authority and your child's school's duties to provide support, and good practice so that you should expect from your child's school and your local authority. And perhaps most important of all, and something that crops up in most of our inquiries, is that we cover how to work together with your child's school and to resolve disagreements or possibly hopefully avoid disagreements before they arise to make sure that your child's rights to support for learning are, are being met. So we provide advice and information in a range of ways. Uh, we do it through our helpline and um, that you can contact us by phone, by email. Uh, you can use the web form on our website. Uh, and we also have a web chat service, which you'll see is available um, on our website when someone is available uh, to provide that service. And all the details for our helpline service are available on our Facebook page. Um, and also on our website, um, which is where we also provide a lot of advice and information. So our website for parents and carers is enquire.org.uk, and I think Hannah's going to kindly share uh, the link um, to that uh, uh, as I'm speaking. Um, so the website itself contains a lot of information, and you can also download all of our publications from the website all of our fact sheets and, um, and any kind of social media posts that we put up, any infographics, and our guide for parents and carers. So you can either download that or you can actually request for us to send you out a copy because it's more like a book, so you might want that in your hand. Um, we also provide advice and information through our social media um, channels. That's mainly Facebook and Twitter, so keep an eye on those for more bite-sized information um, about support for learning. Um, like I said, we provide advice and informa information for children and young people as well. So we do that mainly through our REACH website, which is reach.scot. And there you can find advice and information that's produced with and, and by children and young people um, who are maybe also struggling at school and want to share their experiences. And there's a lot of information about other people who also provide help and support for children when they're when they're having a few difficulties at school. So it might be something that you want to look at with uh, your child. And lastly, about Inquire, um, we are in partnership with a number of other uh, organizations to provide the My Rights, My Say service. And that service provides advice and um, support, including advocacy to children aged 12 to 15 uh, to help them use their rights. Uh, so uh, that website, I think again, Hannah will share that, the, Link to that website as well for my rights my say. So that's us um, in a nutshell um, and as part of uh, the Inquire team I'm really pleased to say that Hannah and Mark are here with us today. Uh, they're here to answer your questions about identifying and assessing your child's needs. They are really experienced and knowledgeable advisors, they both work on the helpline so I'm sure they'll be able to answer many of your questions uh, if we can't answer them, we will uh, look, look, look up answers and get back to you. So, um, but I'm sure they'll be able to, to deal with the vast majority of questions. So we have about 40 minutes uh, to answer your questions. And um, so please do start posting them in, our, in the comments field below the video. If we don't get to your question, then please just get in touch with us through the helpline. And also, if you ask a complicated question that might take a bit longer to answer, again, we might ask you to contact our helpline. Um, and that goes for questions that aren't particularly relevant for this topic today. Um, so, so we'll let you know if we think that it's actually maybe a helpline type question rather than a, a Q&A question. We will uh, post any links that we um, mention to websites and um, publications as we go along. And you know, it's quite a short time that we're on and 
you might miss a bit of your typing a question. So don't worry about that because we're actually recording this session and it will be available on Facebook um, afterwards. So you can always go back and take another look. Uh, we, this is only our second Q&A, so we want to make sure we're meeting your needs. So please do give us feedback. Um, we'll post a, a link to a very short evaluation survey at the end, but you're also welcome to give us feedback in the comments field as well. And just before I pass over to Mark, a very quick request. Please don't share your child or any other children's names or the names of schools or teachers during this, during this session. We just want to make sure we're protecting everyone's privacy. Okay, so uh, that's um, a very brief introduction. I'm going to just pass over to Mark now, who'll talk a little bit about the su subject of today's session. Thanks, Harriet. Um, so yeah, I just thought I would give a bit of a brief overview of some of the key things to be aware of about um, assessing your child's needs. So this is a topic that comes up a lot on our helpline. So we hear about it from a lot of different parents and carers. The first thing that's worth clarifying is maybe just the definition of additional support needs in the law. So it, the law says that if a child or a pupil needs um, extra or different help than what's normally provided to pupils their same age, then they have additional support needs. Um, so interestingly, that means that your child does not need a, a formal diagnosis to have a right to get help Help if they need help with their learning. Um, the purpose of having an assessment of your child's needs is really to help the, the local authority and the nursery or their school to identify and understand um, your child's individual needs and, and that let, then lets them make sure they're providing the support that they need. That Because of that, we always say that the earlier assessments can be done, generally the better, um, to make sure that schools and nurseries are set up to help your child from the kind of get-go. The, the process of, of assessing needs is quite a, a broad one. People can often think it's a kind of individual test or something, but actually it's regularly kind of done just as day-to-day -day as part of their your child's learning and the kind of teacher observations or maybe their support um, member of staff that works closely with them in the nursery, just kind of picking up on something and seeing that they're maybe struggling in a certain area or, or falling behind some of their peers in particular things and need a bit of extra help. Um, but other times it can they, it might need a kind of more specific assessment of their needs with some involvement from other professionals, for example, like an educational psychologist or, or someone from health, for example, CAMS with uh, mental health. Um, regardless of how an assessment is done, though, um, they should always try and make sure that it has a kind of minimal disruption to your child's learning and um, you, you should be involved in in the process as well because naturally you'll know your child best and you're the expert on your own child and um, you'll have a lot of valuable insights to share in terms of um, where your child's strengths lie and, and maybe where they could do with some extra help or where they're struggling um, we have, as Harriet mentioned on our website, um, a lot of different publications, and we've got a fact sheet specifically on this topic that's called Identifying and Assessing Your Child's Needs. So it covers all of that, and it also explains um, how to maybe have some conversations with your child's nursery or school if you are worried about um, them and feel like they might need some more support. Um, it also goes into the details around how you can request directly to the local authority for your child's needs to be assessed um, and ex explains the kind of do's what you can and what you can't do with that. So for example, you can um, request a kind of educational or psychological or medical assessment, but you couldn't um, request a specific person to carry out the assessment, say your preferred doctor. Um, finally, it also explains a little bit about um, how sometimes you can go directly to services. So if it was a, a health problem that you were concerned about, for example, you could go straight to the GP. Um, but hopefully that's a bit of a broad overview of the topic. Um, but I'm not sure, Harriet, if we've had any questions in yet that we can maybe get to and try and answer for folk. Yes, we've had a, a few questions coming in already, so thank you very much for those. Um, Sobia um, has uh, said that her, start, her son has just started high school, but there's no uh, support in place because he's not diagnosed. Um, however, he has been under CAMS, um, I think perhaps waiting for two years for a diagnosis, but he's really struggling with sensory overload. So she's asking who can diagnose um, uh, for sensory processing processing disorder or autism and what should she do? 
Yeah, it's it's a really difficult situation when there's long waiting lists, and it is something we hear about quite a lot. Um, I think the in the first instance, the important thing to remember is that you shouldn't have to have a diagnosis, a formal diagnosis for your for your child to get support. So if they're struggling at the moment, then that's something that you can speak to the school about and, and talk about and um, try and get a shared understanding of what things they are finding difficult and what things they are finding challenging and, and where and um, what type of supports the school could try and put in place. And um, those supports can then adapt and change as they get more information. So hopefully once an assessment does take place and you do get a diagnosis, then they can kind of review where things are at and, and what more they might be able to do based on the kind of recommendations from professionals. Um, but sometimes it will unfortunately kind of take as long as it's going to take when there is a waiting list. So that's why we recommend trying to kind of focus on sitting down with the school to kind of say, well, what can we do in the meantime while we're waiting on that? What things might help? Um, I'm not sure, Hannah, if you've got anything that you'd add to that or? Yeah, no, I think that's the main thing. It sounds like a really tough situation. So yeah, you know, I think that the main thing to know with the school, as Mark says, is that, you know, your child has a right to support and, you know, they know that um, he's struggling with sensory issues. That's the sort of thing that can be written into a plan and can be looked at even if we don't have a specific diagnosis you know if he's struggling he has a right to support um with we wouldn't advise on kind of specific types of assessment but that's the sort of thing where you can ask the school about that um, and see what they can do and what they can look to um, in the meantime so i suppose the main thing we're saying is kind of speaking to the school and you know you really knowing that he has a right to support at school whether or not he has a diagnosis and actually the school and the education authority looking at how else while they're while you're waiting for that diagnosis that they can provide support so he gets the most from their education um is it, have we got any other questions harriet to go i hope that's enough for the moment so be obviously you can always call us if you want to talk about that more um yeah so um we have another question from jacqueline um she's asking um where, where the parents so can I ask parents of phoning social work and being told they don't need assessments? Uh, I think, Jacqueline, we may need to sort of clarify this, but um, it sounds like what you're asking is that if you're being told that social work are saying they don't need an assessment, can these um, children go to a, an additional support needs school? So I guess you're asking whether a child can go to a specialist school if they don't have an assessment by, by social work. Yeah, so if that is the kind of question, um, some specialist schools do have kind of certain criteria where they'll um, try to kind of support children with a specific kind of set of needs because that's where the school specialty lies. Um, so sometimes um, it might be necessary to have a particular type of kind of assessment done to, to get access to their, that school. But generally speaking, um, the local authority has a responsibility to make sure they're offering your child a suitable education and they can give them the the support that they need. So the first instance is they should be trying to put in place supports to help them at their current school, at their kind of local or mainstream school. Um, but if they're not able to meet their needs there and not able to offer them a suitable um, education and the right support, then it's the local authority's responsibility to consider other options and to see where else they might be able to offer. Um, so if, if the social work department are kind of saying that they're they don't personally feel that there's a kind of need for an assessment, then it might be worth, if you've not already done so, getting in touch with the um, additional support for learning contact at your local authority. And on our website, you can find the, the contact details for each, each local authority in Scotland and who their key people are. Um, yeah, I think that sounds um, like a good next step, Mark, I suppose. And it's just the kind of thing you were saying there um, that all the professionals should be working together. So social work and education in terms of the law around your child's rights around learning and support. And um, that falls to your local authorities education department. So when you are talking about schools, obviously everyone should be working together, but it can be quite helpful to get in touch directly with that contact in the local authority education department if you're concerned to talk about how a school or how a school isn't meeting your child's needs and what the next step is and getting kind of everyone involved in that conversation. And so I hope that's helpful for you. 
Um, how are we doing, Harriet? Is anyone else else? Yeah, I'm just wondering, Hannah, would you be able to have a quick glance at the questions? Um, yeah. Just, mm -hmm. I'm, I've, I, I seem to, have, some of them seem to have gone off the bottom of my page. Oh, no worries. I can notice that we've got one from Lisa, um, who just said that her daughter, her daughter is 14, recently diagnosed with ASD, um, so autism spectrum disorder, um, depression and anxiety. And um, Lisa saying that she's a school refuser and as um, her daughter was at a private school, she's not registered with the local authority. Um, and Lisa's wondering what help she can get. So sorry, I've read that out complicatedly. So Lisa's daughter's 14, um, has some recent diagnosis, but was previously at a private school and is not registered. So I suppose what she's asking is what help she can get um, and what their next steps are. Yeah, so the 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 rights and things that we've discussed so far around kind of the right to request an assessment of, of needs and to get the support that you need is, is where the local authority is responsible for a young person's education. So if um, your daughter Lisa is um, kind of enrolled in a, at an independent school and that's not been done through the kind of local authority, then um, they they don't legally have a responsibility at the moment to offer support or to, to do any further assessments. But what they do have is a kind of discretion um, to kind of do an assessment if you asked for it. So that means in some circumstances, they might agree to kind of do that if they felt it was in the child's best interest and they were able to, um, but they, they wouldn't have to. So to try and kind of help her get the right support, um, it would be about trying to work together with her, her school. And, and if ultimately you felt that that wasn't working or wasn't kind of meeting her needs, then another option would be to get in touch with your local authority and consider the option of um, enrolling her at one of the local authority schools and kind of getting her started there because as soon as you did that, at that point, the, the legal protections would come in where she would have the right to get support with her learning. Um, and that would include things like um, helping her try and build back up to getting back into school again and things. Yeah. yeah yeah no that sounds great mark i think um that would probably be the key thing it's about um where you're kind of wanting your daughter to go next and you know you might find our young people's website as well helpful in talking about it talks a lot about school refusal but the kind of key thing we talk about is if it is that you um feel that you would like the local authority be to be responsible for education to get in touch with them and start those conversations about how they could support her back into school are you managing to find the comments, Harry? Or... I, 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 um, if you can just carry on providing the comments just now, Hannah, yeah. sorry. I'm just, uh... That's fine. So I, I actually just spotted Hannah that Lisa's come mm. back to us and explained that she she was at the private school but actually has no school at the moment so she's not enrolled anywhere it doesn't sound like um so for that if that's the case lisa then um all kind of children and young folk between the ages of five and 16 have a right to a school education or right to an education um, and it's the kind of responsibility of of parents and carers to make sure that they get that so if she's not enrolled anywhere then um you could kind of it's for you to try and make sure she's getting an education while she's home, while, if you're home educating her. And there are some organizations that can offer advice and support around uh, parents that choose to home educate. Um, or if you don't feel able to do that or don't feel like that's the right option for your daughter, then it would be your responsibility to get her enrolled at a local authority school. And, and once you did that by getting in touch with the kind of local authority, the council, um, then they would then start to become responsible alongside you to make sure that they're offering her um, a suitable school placement and the support that she would need with her learning. Yeah, it sounds like there's a few different comments and coming around about that, Mark, but um, from um, some of the families, it's certainly a really tough situation. Um, yeah. I was just noticing um, a few different things going on. So I know Gillian said that she was looking for some advice um, to be sent out to her. Gillian, if you want to put um, message us either online or uh, through Facebook Messenger or send us an email or your address, we can certainly post out some information to you. Um, I can see that um, Sobia was saying that they, um, her son, we were just talking about 
her situation has been struggling since P1, but she's not feeling listened to. Um, so I suppose maybe there's a bit about that that we can maybe just cover just now about if you feel your voice isn't being heard or there's issues around assessments, maybe if you or Harriet want to talk about that, Mark, and I'll have a look for some more questions. It's all going on on our call. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, so yeah, if, if you're not feeling listened to, that's obviously a, a really tough situation to be in. I'm sorry to hear that's how you're sort of feeling at the moment, but you do absolutely have a right to be involved in decisions about your child's support. And um, we have a, a fact sheet on working together with the school that is quite a helpful um, resource to kind of prepare for meetings and to try and make sure that in discussions you are being listened to and they are taking what you're saying seriously. So, for example, if you're having a meeting, um, you have a right to have someone there for some support. Um, I appreciate at the moment with coronavirus, meetings might be happening in a slightly different way, say by kind of call or video chat. Um, but your rights are still the same. So you could have a, a friend, a, a colleague, a partner, someone come along for a bit of moral support maybe and um, prepare in advance some of the key things you want to raise with them. But if ultimately you kind of can't seem to agree things with the school and you still are worried about your child's support and feel that they do need to have their needs assessed and the school aren't looking to take that forward, then that's where you have a right to request your child's needs be assessed directly to the local authority. Um, so our, our fact sheet explains more about that, um, but you can basically write to them or, or use another medium that's sort of a recordable that you can look back so an, an audio recording or something like that but normally it would be that you'd write to them um, and explain that you're looking for your child's needs to be assessed and you'd have to set out some details like your kind of name and child's name and details and what school they go to and some background information about why you're asking for the assessment and what it is you're kind of looking to get from it um, but the local authority would then make a decision about whether or not they're going to take that forward so it would um, be a way of trying to kind of help make that happen if the school aren't looking to do that for you. Thanks, Mark. Um, I don't know if you've got anything else to add, Harriet, or I can, there's a few other quite interesting questions that might be worth discussing. So um, Leslie's asked, um, can, a school, can, school staff, can school staff refuse to assess any ch um, a child if they appear to be doing okay? And that's something we sometimes have conversations about where your child might be managing okay at school and when they come home that might be where you're seeing the distress and um, so it might be quite helpful to talk a bit around that. Yeah sure so it, it's really important that schools take account of children's whole well-being so not just how they're getting on say academically but also if school's having a big impact on them at home and, and on their mental well-being and things. Um, so they, they should be kind of trying to take that into account and listening to your views and, and the information you share with them about your concerns and what the impact that you're seeing it have on your child. Um, the In terms of the assessment and whether a school can refuse it, so the it's the responsibility of the education authority, so the education department in your local council, um, it's their responsibility to identify and understand the kind of children, their pupils' needs, support needs. And the schools will often do that on their behalf because it's schools that kind of work with your children day to day. Um, so the first place would normally be to try and come to an agreement with the school to, to address your concerns. But if there is that disagreement and you're struggling to see eye to eye and they're not worried about your child and don't feel they need um, their needs assessed, but you really do feel like that might be helpful to say help the school better understand why your child's struggling a bit and the impact it's having, then you've got a right to go directly to the local authority and, and ask um, for an assessment that way. Um, and the local authority would then consider it and they would likely speak to the school as well and, and the other professionals if there's others professionals already involved in supporting your child and they would take account of things like if an assessment had already been done recently and things when they make the decision of whether or not to kind of go ahead and, and either ask the school to do an assessment or to um, refer it to other professionals to help them do that. I don't know if there's anything you want to add um, or we can kind of go on to another question. So there's quite a lot coming in. We're probably not going to get to everyone, I'm afraid. Yeah, but try our best. <laughs> get, uh, do get in touch. Um, so um, Arlene um, has, asked, um, has explained that her son um, is seven and is waiting for 
I'm still waiting for a diagnosis. Um, and the school said they were going to get a psychologist involved, but that was three months ago and they've heard, they haven't heard anything. And at the moment, um, he's not getting access to extra support because he's undiagnosed. It sounds like we probably already covered some of those things, but um, it might be just worth reiterating that. Also, um, Arlene's mentioned that um, her son's been self-harming. So, you know, there are resources out there that maybe Mark can mention as well around that. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. Um, it, it sounds like a, a really kind of worrying time for you, Arlene, especially if your son's sort of struggling and started to self-harm and things. So the, the first thing is to focus on trying to keep him safe and well and to get him and yourself some support there there's a, a charity called young minds that has a parent line and um, they're uk wide but they offer advice and support to families that are supporting children and young folk who are struggling with their mental health so um, i'm sure one of my colleagues can post the link to their contact details but that might be a good place if you've not already spoken um, to someone about it to to have a chat with for some advice about um, making sure your son's getting some support and things and also for you because that's a really tough thing to be dealing with as a parent um, in terms of the kind of the waiting the waiting time of three months that is a, a difficult situation and a worried one especially if you can see your son struggling in the meantime it, it really does come back to the fact that the school should be taking action now to try and put in place supports and um, if they can see that he's really struggling then they should be working together with you and and trying to to address um the areas that they can see he's finding really difficult and as as i mentioned earlier that can uh, those supports can be adapted and changed as say hopefully the once the educational psychologist is able to be more involved then they might be able to offer some suggestions and supports that might be more helpful um, it, it might be a good idea if you've not already just to go back to the school to try and ask for some clarification on when they are expecting to hear back or what the waiting time is. Uh, if the school themselves aren't sure of that, then another option would be to try and get in touch with the educational psychology service yourself directly. Um, again, on our website that I think we've already linked to um, that has the contact details for local authorities, uh, there should be a link normally to most of the um, areas have a kind of direct contact for the the psychology services so and um, there's nothing wrong with giving them a call to find out um, how long you're expecting to wait but i'm also conscious i'm uh, <laughs> speaking an awful lot so harriet or if either of you want to add in you're more than welcome <laughs> No, I just have to apologise for my my uh, silence. Um, I, I've been struggling with with being able to access the comments, so um, uh, I've I've been uh, a little distracted on that. Um, uh, so thanks, Hannah, for for taking over. If if um, so, if we want to move on to the next question, um, and hopefully that's absolutely fine. <laughs> and Mark, you're doing grand jobs. Uh, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think Tess is. Um, I mentioned that um, her child um, um, is almost 14 and just gone on a list. I think by that she probably means that um, that they're maybe on a waiting list for um, um, one of the assessments of the different kinds. Sure. Um, now, um, now he um, could be over 16 before his time comes for that assessment. So um, she's wondering what sort of help there is. Um, around that so I suppose it's just kind of um, the key thing would be that he's 14 at the moment but there's going to be quite a long waiting list um, around that and, um, and Tess is concerned about that. Yeah sure um, so Tess that I mentioned earlier that the kind of children and, and young people have a an, an individual right to school education up until they're 16 but as long as your your son is still at school like it is kind of enrolled at a school then they have the right to continue on with their education for the kind of senior phases of school and um, and as long as he's at school he has an ongoing right to to get the support that he needs and to have his needs assessed and um, if that is already in process so it's it's not a case that if you don't get it quite before he's 16 that then it's too late that shouldn't be the case at all as long as he's at school everything that we've said so far is still relevant so the school should still be making sure they're taking steps to understand his needs and to try and put supports in place keep those under review and and kind of adapt and change them as uh, his needs change or as they get more information and advice from professionals about how they might better be able to help him 
Yeah, thanks, Mark. I've just um, I've just added a, a fact sheet um, into the comments, which is about um, sort of education and support after sixteen, which which will hopefully clarify uh, that for you. Um, I think it's something that a lot of parents and and young people are uh, are not that aware of, and um, sort of tend to assume that if the school is talking about le their child leaving. Um, that, that that's their only option, but it's really important to consider all options um, uh, when, when children and young people are moving up to that sort of age. And the planning should start for that, you know, to think about post-16 options at least a year before um, a, a child or young person gets to that stage. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I realised like, my answer, I kind of presumed that they would want to stay on at school, but there's plenty yeah, of yeah, folk no, that don't want like to that. do that. <laughs> yeah. So the, the fact sheet that Harriet's mentioned has links to some other organisations too. So for example, there's Leeds Scotland that gives um, sort of equivalent advice to ourselves, but for options for after school, including things like college and, and university and what supports might be available there for young folk. Yeah, I hope that goes somewhere for um, Arlene. Um, there is a question from Vicky. I think, Vicky, it sounds like your question to me a bit more about part time placements and um, hours. And it sounds like a tough and complicated situation. So it might be one that is maybe better to give us a call as it might not be something we can cover in enough detail here. Um, but I think we maybe got time for one or two more questions. Um, Fiona's um, was told by um, the special education needs co coordinator, I think Senko, um, at her daughter's school that she doesn't have ASN. Um, and um, and um, there's been quite a few challenges with that. Um, and Fiona was kind of asking what kind of steps she has. So her daughter has selective mutism and considerable anxiety. Um, and she's kind of understood the additional support for learning that that from that she would have ASN and it's just kind of wondering I think a bit about her next steps when she's being told that her child doesn't have ASN. Yeah it's a really difficult one when you kind of um, where there is a people are seeing things in a different way and around what what support your daughter might need so the the definition of additional support needs is very broad so as I said at the beginning it just comes down to if if your daughter needs extra or different help than what's normally offered to pupils of the same age then she would be considered as having additional support needs and um, if the kind of the Senko that that was in touch with you has said that they don't feel that she does have needs and um, does, does need extra help then um, then an next step might be trying to kind of put your concerns in writing maybe to the kind of management in within the schools to so say the kind of deputy or the head teacher to try and ask for a meeting to to get to the bottom of that disagreement and to see if you can try and find some shared understanding of of the things that you feel your daughter is struggling with and what supports she might need and um, then if if you've already tried that or if you did speak with the school and the schools still were of the position that your your child didn't need any help then and um, it would be worth getting in touch with the local authority to have a chat with their additional support for learning contact to, to have a chat with them and about your concerns and um, something as well that is an option if if you're struggling to kind of see eye to eye well, sometimes with the school is to request mediation. So um, well, there's- Sorry to interrupt you there, but I just, I just want to, um, just in case um, we're going down a line that's maybe not available to, to the person who asked that question, because you mentioned Senco, it suggests that it's maybe a, um, a question from someone who's, who's in England or, or, or possibly Wales. Um, uh, so um, the systems are different down there. I think the advice that Mark's given um, is is very you know applicable wherever you are in the country in terms of trying to work together and and resolve disagreements. Uh, but the legal framework is slightly different in Scotland. So sorry to interrupt you there, Mark. But I um, oh, not at all. was a little worried that we might be um, uh, sort of um, giving somebody some some advice that's not available. I think um, that there are um, services in um, England uh, that um, provide similar services to us which I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll share on, on the screen on the comments section just now but um, if you are in Scotland um, then um, Mark I think Mark was going to go on and talk about mediation so I'll leave you to do that Mark whilst I find the yeah, no problem at all. Thanks for the clarification. It okay. is worth mentioning, <laughs> definitely. But um, presuming you are in Scotland, then um, one of the options to try and 
get things back on track and, and working again together with the kind of school and with the local authority would be to request independent mediation. So that's where um, you can ask for a kind of service to become involved where they're completely independent and impartial. They're not there on your side or on the school or the council side, but they're there to help facilitate a kind of meeting and to try and help make sure that everyone gets a fair chance to, to kind of share their views and to be heard and listened to and to encourage you to try and find a solution and a way forward again and that can be a really helpful option sometimes where relationships are becoming a bit strained and, and it, things are maybe feeling a bit difficult and um, to just get things back on track and get everyone speaking to each other again and focusing back on um, the most important thing which is focusing on your child and what they need and, and what things can help get things uh, in a better place for them. Yeah, thanks. Great, Mark. Yeah, there's quite a lot around there that we can certainly talk more about as well if people have kind of specific situations um, around that. Um, we've got a few questions coming in. Um, I think some of them I would hope you've kind of around, um, we've already covered um, 60, um, the rights of young people aged 16, and that if your child is in school, then they continue to have a right to support. Um, we've just had one from Fiona, who was uh, um, saying that her son is three, um, and has started nursery. He's non-verbal and being assessed for ASD. Um, she's wondering, is he entitled to extra support at nursery or do they have to wait until um, he starts at school for extra support? And kind of a question that runs through a few is kind of what does that support look like? Um, so the young person does have an assessment. Oh, thanks, Fiona, for your question. So um, we have a, a fact sheet that I'm sure one of my colleagues will link to about additional support for learning in the early years, which will hopefully answer your questions in more detail than I can kind of go into at the moment. But if you're... Um, if your child kind of from the ages of three and four, they have um, a certain amount of um, entitlement to um, funded hours of early learning. So at the moment, that's 600 hours um, of, of kind of nursery or child care. And once they're kind of in receipt of those, they have a right to get additional support um, in the same way that they would when they're at school. The um, also, some children that are a bit younger can have um, rights if they're if they're a disabled child. So I realise that's not needed here but because um, your son is three but it was just to mention for other parents that may be wondering in in terms of what that support should look like um, the law doesn't really go into the detail of what specific supports support should look like just because every child is going to be different and their needs are going to be different um, but it's about being directed towards the individual needs of your child so the starting point should be trying to say well what things are they struggling with or need extra help with and then trying to kind of together with the nursery and yourself and and maybe some other professionals um, that might be involved in the kind of uh, supporting with ASD um, kind of sitting down and putting a plan in place to say what things can we do and normally in the nursery years that will be quite focused on trying to help them kind of develop their their wider well-being and getting ready to move up to school and, and start to kind of benefit from their learning and we again in our parents guide that's our kind of main booklet or publication that, that Harriet mentioned at the start there is a, a section in it um, I don't have the page number off the top of my head but it goes it lists um, a few different examples of the types of support that can be appropriate in different circumstances so that's not uh, by any means a kind of exhaustive list or or uh, you need to ask for everything <laughs> but it, it can give you an idea of the type of things that might be possible to chat to the nursery about if you're not sure. Right um, I think we might be coming just to the very end of our time we might be able to squeeze in one um, very quick last question um, Hannah if you are able to. Yes I can see I think there's probably I think probably quite a lot, Adriatri, I think we have kind of covered through the course of this conversation and we've maybe had some questions that in a way are probably bigger topics than just on identification of needs. Um, and we will signpost you if you kind of put a comment on that or you can speak um, speak directly to us. Um, I'm just having a look, um, there is a few questions. Um, let me see. I, I'm not seeing anything that's particularly different from what we haven't already covered. I'm sorry, I just haven't seen someone's. Mm -hmm. um, the, the main thing I was, we haven't had a direct question about, but I was wondering if it might be helpful to, um, to talk about a little, um, would be private assessments. Um, is that something um, we've heard, oh, we hear quite a lot about on the helpline. And um, I imagine it's something that maybe some parents might be looking at given the kind of waiting list 
unfortunately, that we've been hearing about in their comments. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in terms of private assessment, some parents do decide to, that that's the best option for their child. But what we would normally say is that you shouldn't have to do that. You shouldn't have to pay for your child to be assessed because the, the local authority has the responsibility to take steps to identify and understand your child's needs. And, and where there is a, a bit of a delay or a waiting list, as I said, that shouldn't be a reason that they can't put in place some supports in the meantime. Um, having said that, if you do decide that that's what's best for you or, or what you'd like to do, then you can share that information with schools and with local authorities and they have a responsibility to take that into account. Um, having said that, that doesn't mean they need to follow the recommendations um, to the letter, so they need to take account of it, but it's ultimately for the local authority uh, and the school nursery to make the final decisions around how they can provide the support to your child that, that they feel they need. Um, but hopefully that covers that. Um, one other thing that kind of came to mind that I've not really mentioned is that we, we've we talked a lot in kind of slightly more general terms around all different types of assessments, but there are lots of different organisations that um, can give you more specialised advice. So, for example, Scottish Autism would have a helpline. Um, there's the Scottish ADHD Coalition that could put you in touch with some kind of local groups and support organisations. So um, we can give the sort of broader advice around what the law says and your rights but if you feel like your child might have a particular set of needs um, then it might be worth kind of having a look at some of those organizations. I suppose the other thing to know is that you know if it's recognized that perhaps your young, um, your young person is um, has particular traits or is needing support with anything there's no reason that tools even if they don't have an official diagnosis can't be used so um, we know that dyslexia is something certainly that um, there, there's not often an official diagnosis for or schools um, can be a bit unsure about kind of going down that route straight away. But the Dyslexia Toolkit that Dyslexia Scotland have has lots of advice and resource. And the key thing in the law is that your child doesn't need a diagnosis to be entitled to assessment. So that means those resources and those suggestions, you know, they can be used and put into a plan if they're helping your child learn. You know, the key thing is about what their needs are identified as and how they can be supported at school rather than whether there is an official diagnosis. Um, I think yeah. that's um, the main issues we've gone to. I don't know if there's anything else we want to cover. Um, there's obviously more questions coming in, so certainly give us a ring if you feel it hasn't been covered. Have a look at our fact sheets. Um, I'm just having a look yeah. to see other things. I don't know well, if we've got thing, I, Yeah, I can't remember if we mentioned it or not, but probably worth mentioning it, although everyone will be sick of hearing about it by now, but it's coronavirus. Um, so it, the fact when coronavirus has kind of happened, it's obviously made things quite challenging and difficult for a lot of schools and for services, um, but it's worth um, remembering that the law hasn't changed. So the, the council and the, the schools and nurseries still have a responsibility to take steps to identify your child's needs. And while um, some processes may have changed. So for example, educational psychologists in the past would regularly sort of be within classrooms and observe your child as they're learning. And um, that might need to happen in slightly different ways, like from seeing them outside or speaking and consulting with you in the school and things like that. Um, as much as some adaptions might need to be made, they still have a, a responsibility to to get your child's needs assessed if they if that's needed to, to know how to help them. And I think it's probably something that's been a theme, not just around coronavirus, but particularly in some of the questions is around some young people really struggling with their mental health at the moment. And that sounds like really difficult situations and something we do hear about on the helpline. And I suppose the important thing to be aware is, you know, if, if you are on a waiting list, but your child is struggling, you know, do go back if things have changed, you know, speak to your GP, speak to your school. You know if you need support and things are escalating then you know do raise those concerns and um, we have information on that and organizations like young minds as well so um we and our reach website as well covers a lot about that as well yeah and a lot of those links are now in the in the comments field i'm aware of time we've just got a minute or so left so it is time to wrap up i'd just like to say very a very big thank you to hannah and mark um for um holding the fort whilst I was struggling with, with um, uh, uh, Facebook. Um, we um, hope that you've got um, uh, at least some information that you need from today's session. Just a reminder that you can get in touch with the helpline 
if you if you have some more specific questions that you want to ask or you feel that we haven't answered your questions today. Um, uh, the recording will go live um, shortly after this, so you can you can have a have another listen through and look at the comments as well, of course. Um, and I'm um, would be really grateful if you could um, um, give us some feedback um, through comments or through the evaluation form, which I'm just about to share with you just now. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you for the next uh, session, which will be on planning. Uh, um, for your child support and that's going to be on the 26th of January and um, just making sure that nobody's looking at that I've got the wrong date I think it's the 26th of January um, so uh, and obviously we'll give we'll, we'll give you lots of information about that in advance um, uh, so I hope to see you then so thank you very much thank you very much for all your comments